phone. I have some nice pictures from the USDA to show you. Quality grades. Uh, so going back to what we would expect to see for prime beef, um, here's probably a red Angus, drawing of a red Angus, and you see how much bigger and fatter that animal is. These animals can get to be a couple thousand pounds, and then on the way, all the way down to utility grade, um, that's Bessie, the, the dairy cow, who is no longer producing milk in sufficient quantity. We send her off to the slaughterhouse for our ground beef or spam if you eat canned meat products, <laughs> uh, which I, I hope you do so at least once in your life. OK, so we can see, obviously, the, the, the very obvious from, the, from the, just looking at the animal how, um, what quality meat we might expect to get off of that animal. Obviously, the bigger the fatter the animal, the greater the marbling inside the animal. Yield grades as well for a particular beef cow. You see that even for yield grade one, we're still talking about a pretty hefty animal uh, compared to a dairy cow. Um, and then, um, I'm sorry, yield grade one and yield grade five. Um, so we don't, you know, it's, it's, this is less obvious. And frankly, this is something that's of more concern to the, to the cattle herder uh, than it is to us. But we can see um, that we have a more, a fatter animal here at yield grade five and a more muscular animal here, right? I'm pointing to muscles here at yield grade one. Now, I love these kinds of diagrams, um, but there's not much here for you to memorize. It, it's nice to be familiar with the different uh, sections of the animal different kinds of meat that you get off of different sections of the animal it has a lot to do with how you're going to cook that to cook that product so we should at least mention that um, the fore part of the animal and the hind limbs of the animal are among the the most heavily used muscle parts of the of the beef and therefore are the toughest tend to be the toughest and so you see roasts here uh, turning that into ground beef, perhaps there's another pot roast. Um, likewise, in the in the in the hind um, quarters, you have the, the another rolled rump for roasting, um, cube steaks, a more ground beef, and those again, the legs are where the we're seeing most of the work happening. The interior of the animal, um, or that is internal to the to the uh, to the legs, is where the more tender cuts of meat are going to be. So we see rib steaks, T-bone steaks. Here we're talking about slicing through the animal right where the where, where the ribs are coming down. And as we move back, we get to the more and more tender pieces of meat minus bones, right? Sirloin. This is the sirloin area here. Um, interesting, too, we have the flanks uh, down below the ribs. We have flank steak, another nice cut of meat relatively tender. Um, and for our region particularly, where we're interested in tri-tip, we see that the tri-tip is actually comes from a couple of different parts of the animal down below that sirloin area and before you get down into the rear, the hindquarters. Um, the tip, you know, you don't, you don't see tri-tip on this list and it's, it's useful to point that out only because the cuts of meat that we see vary dramatically from region to region, certainly, and also from country to country. So this this particular set of re retail cuts doesn't bear much resemblance necessarily to what you might find in Europe, for example, or South America. And again, too, tri-tip, that's something that's very local, and this would be something that normal other regions you might see converted straight into ground beef. But here we, in uh, the central coast of California, we eat it quite frequently. Uh, this is another one, again, just showing you how how many different cuts of meat there are and again reminding you that we cut it we, we separate between the rear the rear uh, hind, the hind quarters and the, uh, the fore quarters and the uh, rib area and then the loins um, and again the most tender piece parts of the animal are going to come from this region here but again mostly we see that we have a lot of different cuts of meat that are referred to differently by different groups of people it's 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 a little bit confusing but instead let's turn now to a discussion of red meat 
and white meat and what determines whether it's red or white. Well, the USDA classifies meat as red or white and that depends primarily on the myoglobin content. Uh, myoglobin is an oxygen storage protein so you can imagine that working muscle requires oxygen and in order to maintain a steady supply of oxygen the muscles need to be packed with myoglobin which carry which holds that oxygen there once it's delivered from the lungs by another protein called hemoglobin why does working muscle require oxygen well this takes us back to the our whole idea of fermentation and energy production um, this is going to be complex metabolism for a lot of you so let's keep it simple though uh, we burn sugars, remember, to generate NADH. That's an electron source for a pathway called the mitochondrial electron transport chain. That chain, electron transport chain, takes NADH, takes the electron from it, converts it to something called NAD+, and as it does so, it uh, generates a mo that molecule again called ATP. So we use the energy in NADH to generate ATP, which as I said earlier, is how the myosin draws itself along the actin filament. Hydrolysis or consumption of an ATP provides an energy source for the contraction of the muscles. Now, the mitochondrial in electron transport chain requires oxygen. So the electrons are taken from NADH and given directly to oxygen and generating two molecules of water for every one molecule of oxygen. That's in the, in the shortest possible terms, the simplest possible terms is what electron transport is. So we got to have NADH from, from consumption of sugars and we got to have O2 for accepting those electrons. So with, and without O2 therefore, no muscle contraction, except for through the via the fermentative processes that we already discussed in, in, previous, uh, in previous lectures. And I guess I should say that that kind of fermentation is happening in muscle tissue as well. We're not converting pyruvate to lac to uh, ethanol, but we're converting pyruvate to lactic acid. So that when muscle does go anaerobic, which it which it frequently does, for short periods of time, we can use that fermentative process of lactic acid production to continue uh, energy production, that is ATP production, so that that myosin can again keep drawing itself along the actin filaments and have muscle contraction. Now, there's our, I'm sorry for that metabolism interlude, but it has to happen. In any case, back to red meat. Again, classifications based on that content of myoglobin, the oxygen storage protein, and the USD calls beef, pork, lamb, and goat, or any livestock animal, red meat. All right, so you might you might be used to thinking about pork as a white meat, but according to the USDA, uh, it's myoglobin content constitutes a red meat organism, whereas poultry and fish are white meat. What is the difference between white and dark meat? Well, white meat tends to be um, so-called fast twitch muscle. The fibers are very thick and they depend on glycogen for energy. So what is glycogen? We've talked about amylopectin in previous lectures. Glycogen is just an animal version of amylopectin, which is that plant storage that plant carbohydrate storage molecule. Glycogen is a branched polymer of glucose and it provides a quick energy source for this for those muscle cells. Uh, remember again that glycolysis, degradation of that starch into glucose and then consumption of the glucose generating an ADH, blah blah blah. Um, that's our source of energy for muscle contraction. So ultimately sugar is is one of the primary fuel sources for uh, for providing the ATP for muscle contraction. Um, so they're fat. These white muscle fibers are fat and they're built for speed. So short bursts of intense uh, intense activity. Whereas the slow twitch muscles um, they're uh, thin and then they're dense with myoglobin and mitochondria. Mitochondria are, are where that electron transport chain happens and we'll see that the mitochondria are full of iron and other and other colored uh, molecules as well um, and myoglobin. So those the, the mitochondria and the myoglobin are what give us that reddish color to the in our slow twitch um, red or uh, red muscle tissue. Slow twitch is meant for long-term activity. They're, sm they're thinner fibers so that the oxygen from the blood can diffuse more readily into them. 
Um, whereas the fast twitch muscles are relying more on glycolysis, again, glycogen, to glycolysis to, to care, take care of energy production under anaerobic conditions. Now, on the right here, we see some electron micro, or there's a light micrograph and an electron micrograph. This is stained for mito, a mitochondrial enzyme, not mitochondria itself. Um, it doesn't matter for us what the enzyme is. If you care, it's called succinate dehydrogenase. This enzyme is important in energy production, and we see that in red muscle, we stain densely for mitochondria, and in white muscle, we stain less densely for mitochondria. So we see there's some there's some physical differences that we can see between red and white muscle. Um, here's a muscle fiber, and I guess this would be probably a, a white muscle fiber. I'm only showing you this because uh, here's a this is a cross section through a mitochondrion. That's where that energy production is taking place. And then there you can also see some glycogen granules here. So we're producing a we have to have a very dense energy production machinery in muscle tissue in order to sustain that uh, muscle contraction. What about that color, though? I mentioned that the color comes from iron. Well, hemoglobin, myoglobin, and all those mitochondrial electron transport chain enzymes use an org organic, that is a carbon-based compound called a heme. This is called a heme molecule. And that heme does one job. It binds an iron atom. And the iron atom is so important to to energy production and muscle contraction because what the iron does is sit inside the heme which is buried inside a protein and bind an oxygen atom and again bringing the oxygen to the muscle and storing the oxygen for later use is critical to energy production I gave you a really great article to read about meat color uh, written by our friend um, um, McGee um, and he, he goes into more detail than I'm gonna hit in this section but let me just say that the color of blood and of meat depends on what kind of molecule is bound at that iron. Uh, remember, the myoglobin is storing the oxygen in the muscle tissue, and if we have oxygen bound at the iron, then we have a bright red tissue, right? And if we have carbon monoxide, interestingly, we also get a bright red tissue. Let's come back to the carbon monoxide, CO carbon monoxide, and first let's look at what happens when. The, the muscle becomes deoxygenated instead of maybe binding a water molecule. Well, we see a dramatic shift in the color from bright red to purplish or brownish. So this is one reason that people would look at a cut of meat in, in the, on the shelf in the grocery store and decide whether it's fresh or not, and that's because uh, we have more oxygen bound the, more, the closer we are to the slaughtering of that meat, and the longer it sits there, the longer we have to exchange away the oxygen for water. Perhaps the oxygen get, gets consumed by those mitochondrial enzymes again. So we can use that color as a, at least in principle, as a, as a metric of how fresh the meat is. Now, your book talks about some tricks that have been used now, uh, or maybe, I'm sorry, the article that I gave you gives you some uh, the idea that the the meat industry is, has been using some tricks to to make use of what we think we know about meat freshness by in the factory or in the slaughterhouse treating the meat with carbon monoxide which stays tightly bound to that iron for a much longer period than the oxygen does and that turns the meat bright red so that the meat will stay red for much longer no longer a real indicator of freshness in that case uh, likewise um, the nitrates that are also used to preserve meat can be can be added to um, uh, can, are converted to um, nitric oxide which also NO right so CO OO and NO NO nitric oxide also binds to that iron atom again very stably and also keeping it bright red so we can trick ourselves into thinking that the meat is fresh by exchanging this re relatively short-lived Iron bound, oxygen bound species with carbon monoxide or nitric oxide bound, um, bound meat. Uh, one other thing to say about that is that again, the this these these chemical treatments of the meat are not affecting the quality of meat at all, and certainly we don't have to worry about eating meat that's got carbon monoxide bound at the iron, even though we know that the gas carbon monoxide is a toxin. Um, but what this reflects is a change in the industry of the United States and the world to mass market meat production so that instead of sending a shank of meat to the 
butcher so that he can chop it up for you into all of these all of these wonderful different cuts. Instead, you at a retail store you have the set of cuts that the that the meat producer uh, wants to send to you, and that facilitates their ability to cut, shrink, wrap, and package and treat with carbon monoxide all in one factory and distribute. So it's it's partly a, a, a matter of upscaling um, that has given us this um, these, these sort of manipulations of the meat, if you will.